all appellate court districts within Ohio. There are 88 counties. So if you're unhappy with a trial court decision, you have the right to appeal to the Court of Appeals. You don't have a right to appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court. You have to ask them for jurisdiction. But for the Court of Appeals, they will accept all cases that come before or after the trial court. Some additional things you should know about me. Number one, I've been teaching appellate law since 2001. So I teach appellate practice and procedure. I teach every fall. We have anywhere between usually 30 and 40 students. We teach them how to practice law in the Court of Appeals. We teach them how to write a brief and how to argue in front of a three court panel. So in other words, we prepare them to feel comfortable arguing in front of, can you hear me? Ar arguing in front of the Court of Appeals. So we had our last class yesterday. They turn in their briefs in about eight days and I spend two weeks grading them because it takes a lot of time. Uh, no, number two, I, I do appellate work in the Vandalia Municipal Court. I'm the chief appellate counsel in that court. So if an appeal comes across um, that area, it comes to me. We have two currently uh, we're looking at. And number three, I have experience, judicial experience as a magistrate. I've been a magistrate part-time in Dayton since 2009. So if there's a request or someone needs a substitute, they'll call on me. I'm one of about five or six people who are qualified to do that. When I say that, I mean that we have 40 hours of uh, continuing education in judicial college. So I make sure I keep up with my continuing education. And then just one more thing, my family, I mentioned my son Jack who's a junior. My wife and I have been married for 18 years. We also have a daughter who turns 15 next week. So I hope I have all the presents that I need for her. That's a big deal. Um, she's a swimmer. So I don't know if you any of you are swimmers, but swimming is a six day a week sport. Six nights she's swimming and two mornings she swims at 5 a.m actually three, so I guess I have tomorrow. We'll get up at 4.30 and get her to swim practice. So I think, is that a symbol? Okay, so I've, I think I've used my allotted time. Um, I do have to run. I apologize for not miss, for missing the rest of the evening, for missing the tour, because I'd love to come back and see, see the rest of it. But I encourage you to vote for Chris Epley for Court of Appeals. Appreciate it, thank you very much. See you later. Thank you so much, Mr. Epley. <laughs> um, oh, I can take this off. Oh. Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Gaida Madkor and I am on the PR committee here at the Islamic Society of Greater Dayton. And I'd like to welcome everyone with uh, the greeting that Muslims greet one another with, which is Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Uh, I would like to thank all of the candidates that are here this evening joining us on a Friday night. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming here on a Friday night to join us for this uh, event. And I'd also like to thank CARE Ohio for co-hosting this event with us. So we hope that this is a very informative uh, event and we'll get to know the candidates that are running for office. Uh, we'll get to see what, we'll have an opportunity to see what their stance is on issues that are important to us in Greene County and in, in the state of Ohio. So now I'd like to introduce the secretary of the ISGD board, Mr. Adel Awed, and he will be moderating for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. To take away from the candidates, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I will be the MC, inshallah, for tonight. Uh, and once again, I would like to thank the candidates for coming out here. And I would like to thank CARE for helping uh, or leading and facilitating this event for us. Uh, and with that, uh, we just have a few more people who will give a few words before we'll, let, we'll uh, you know, let it to the candidates so you guys can talk and let us hear your opinions. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the president of ISGD, Dr. Abdul Hamid. Welcome. Thank you again, Adela. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief. I know we're going to listen to the, our dear guests tonight, but I want to give you a quick run about Muslim Americans. You know, we... Muslim Americans in the lowest estimate, at least 1% of the population, up to 2%. What makes them different, what they distinguish Muslim Americans, that the, most of them first and second generation. Muslim American amongst the highest educated people in the United States. I can tell you 5 to 10% of the American Medical Association members are Muslim physicians. So you guys know that Muslims are part of the wave of this country. We hear our kids born and lived here, some of us first generation. But what makes us also unique that we are 
coming with our own culture. We are not affiliated with any party per, per se. We are conservative, but we also uh, value liberties. We value equality. So we are we here to hear. We are here to hear what you guys are gonna tell us because we are open. We are here to build our country together we, for the better of our city, state, and uh, and nation. So thanks a lot for coming. Thank you everyone for coming to tell us what you guys are gonna are we gonna help us. And I'm sure amongst you will be the. Uh, official that will accept the, the duty to serve the, the public and uh, we would love to thank you again for accepting this and coming to us. Thanks a lot and uh, I'll be brief and idle to come here. Now we'll have one more person, one more esteemed guest to speak before we uh, leave it to the candidates, which is uh, our brother Muhammad. He is a member of the Board of Education uh, and he has, uh, just has a few words to share as well. Assalamu alaikum. All right, that, uh, good evening. It's, uh, it's good to see you all. It's great to be here. My name is Mohammed Al Hamdani. I'm the president of the Dane School Board of Education. Um, it's always be, it's great to be back at ISGD, and thank you for care for hosting this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my family came here when I was 10 years old as a refugee from Iraq, and I was elected in 2017 in Dane, Ohio. So um, this mosque was the mosque that sponsored our family, so I'm always grateful to come back here. Um, this is obviously a very important year. It's an election year, 2020. And we all pay attention to national uh, races all the time, but I'm here to tell you as a public official for the local school district that your local officials and your local races are, have more to affect your life than the president of the United States. And most of you probably think I'm crazy, but it's the truth. Uh, decisions that are made locally affect you right away, whereas things that happen in Washington take a while for it to affect you. So pay attention to what, what you hear today and support local candidates. They need your help. And as Muslims, I am here to encourage you to be as active as you can in this election. Um, obviously, a lot of the decisions that happen affect us directly. Sometimes they affect, affect us in negative ways and sometimes in positive ways. So please pay attention and ask questions. Thank you to all the candidates for being here. We appreciate you guys taking the time to come and speak to Muslims. Uh, I, there was a time when this would have never happened. So that I think goes a long way to show that Muslim Americans are becoming a larger a part of American life and we are becoming a larger and larger part of uh, the voting bloc. So thank you again for having me. Thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate it and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, and thanks again to ISG, ISGD and CARE. And I believe next is Yusjid, uh, or is it? Yes, I believe it's Yusjid. So thank you guys again. Take care. Thank you, Brother uh, Mohammed. So my name is Ustjid Hamid, and I'm the Government Affairs Director for CARE Ohio. We will now get into the, um, the forum part of the event. And so before we do that, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we have uh, Sister Basma from our office. Uh, she'll be going around um, signing people up on her phone. Um, and so this way we will add you to our uh, email list. And so this is important because we issue action alerts. These action alerts allow us to contact elected officials to urge them to take action on specific pieces of legislation. And so if we contact them in large numbers, we are more likely to be effective uh, 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 sort of relative to if we were to contact them in smaller numbers. So please sign up. Uh, there are also note cards going around uh, on which you can write questions and you can submit questions. And later in the event, we will uh, ask audience questions as well, inshallah. So in terms of the rules, very straightforward. Each candidate will have roughly 60 seconds to answer each question. Uh, we may ask follow-ups. Uh, some questions will, will be directed at all candidates, while others may be directed at specific candidates. Lena Abawi, Carroll Ohio civil rights attorney, will be the timekeeper for the event. And Lena will indicate that candidates have 15 seconds left by displaying the yellow paper. Uh, and will indicate that candidates are out of time by displaying uh, the red paper. Now, you know, we won't cut anyone off, but we just sort of encourage folks to try to uh, uh, answer their question within that time limit. So uh, we have the following candidates joining us today. We have Mr. Marshall G. Lockman, who is candidate for the Ohio Court of Appeals. We have Ms. Kim McCarthy, who is candidate for the Ohio House of Representatives. We have Mr. Charles Ballard, who is candidate for the Ohio Senate. We have Mr. Colin James Moreau, who is a candidate for the Green County Board of Commissioners. We have Representative Rick Perales, candidate for Green County Board of Commissioners as well. And we have Judge Thomas O'Diam, candidate for the Court of Common Pleas Probate Division. So we will have two microphones going around. One of them will be this one. Um, and so I'm thinking that it may just be easier as, as just if candidates just come up to the podium. Uh, so 
for the first two. Uh, well, the thing is, is will this will this stretch all the way out there? I'm thinking it may just be easier to. Yeah, yeah, but, but then we can just do that. Yeah, they'll be in front of everyone. Thank you, though. So uh, the first question is, why are you running? So, Mr. Lockman, would you like to start us off? I am Marsha Lockman, and I'm running for judge of the Second District Court of Appeals. I have 32 years' experience as a litigator, the last 17 years here in Ohio, primarily in criminal defense litigation, anything from minor misdemeanors all the way up to the most serious felony offenses, including capital murder. Um, I firmly believe in the rights of all people in our judiciary to equal protection of the law. It is, it's a passion of mine. It's why I have focused the last 17 years of my career in criminal defense litigation. It's why when I get a call from a judge to take a difficult case or to take a difficult client, I take it because everyone has that right. And our system only works if there are prosecutors who will prosecute the case, judges who will try the case, and defense attorneys who will defend the accused. And as a judge, I will take that experience with me, understanding that there is no, that everyone in front of me is equal, that everyone has an equal say, and that ultimately the decision has to be based on the law. It's not based on the position of one person over another. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lachman. Next, we will have Ms. Kim McCarthy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim McCarthy. I'm running for the uh, state representative seat in District 73. Um, I'm running because I believe that our communities deserve better than what we have now. Uh, I'm an accountant, I'm a community organizer, and I live right here in Sugar Creek. I believe that we should be using good public policy to create a society that offers every person the opportunity to live a life with dignity and respect. But right now, too many people are being left behind. Decades of a one-party rule have turned Ohio into a pay-to-play state, resulting in the actual issues that we face being neglected. The recent arrest of the House Speaker for running the largest bribery scandal in Ohio's history shows just how deep this corruption runs. I'm running to offer an alternative to that, to actually represent the people who elect me, because we deserve better than that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ballard? The reason why I'm running is because I felt that empathy was lacking in politics in general. Um, healthcare is personal to me because I know people on fixed incomes who had to make a choice between medicine and food. I also witnessed my mom having to go bankrupt because of medical bills. So when I see one party trying to take away healthcare, and not showing any empathy to the sick and people who, who need help, I felt it was, was for somebody to stand up and do something. Um, I'm a retired Air Force person. Um, I work in a small sign shop, but I believe Ohio and the nation can do better for all the citizens, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Mr. Morell? Good evening, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Colin Morrow, I'm running for Green County Commissioner. Uh, the reason I'm running is because everybody in Green, Green County should be represented, not just some of the people. What I believe in is uh, uh, reduce or lower taxes, accountability, both fiscally and morally, which is, is a big issue right now. Uh, infrastructure investment in the uh, municipality should be able to uh, take those, uh, take the monies that are sent from the county and, and use that as they wish in terms of infrastructure. And the other is economic development. I think we need more business, we need to set the conditions to have more businesses come to Greene County. Uh, my background, I'm a defense contractor. I'm a colonel in the Army Reserve. Um, 
lived, uh, spent a lot of time overseas, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Iraq, and I was part of the, uh, the loyal Jirga, a loyal Jirga in uh, 2001 in Afghanistan. So um, I, I, I appreciate all people of all cultures. Um, and I think that it makes us a much better place for that. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank you all for having us here. I spent many years in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and um, I enjoyed that time there and made a lot of friends. So thank you so much. Um, I am Rick Perales. I am your state representative right now. I am termed out and I am running for county commissioner. Uh, my background is I, I'm married. I, got four, I have four children. I have seven grandchildren. I have more kids right over there on my team, which I really appreciate because we got to start moving our young, younger generations into leading our country. They're right there. Thank you for being here. Um, I, um, I, I've served a lot and, and I served at local government. I was a mayor of Beaver Creek. I served eight years at the county commissioner once before. I'm in my eighth year at the uh, um, uh, state level. And I think that uh, I bring a lot of experience, resources, tools, understandings to help bear on the county to make the county much better. So I look forward to talking more and to meeting all of you. Thank you very much. I apologize, but I only speak English. You always make it difficult. My name is Tom O'Diam, and I am the Greene County Probate Judge, and I'm running for re-election for my second full term. The reason I'm running for re-election is because I absolutely love my job. I've, I've had 35-year legal career, all of which I have spent focusing in probate law. I'm a, I was, as a 28-year <clears throat> private practice attorney, I was the only attorney at that time certified as a specialist in probate law. In 2013, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by the governor of Ohio to replace Judge Hagler, who was retiring. And then I was reelected in an unopposed contest in 2014. So my six year term is up and that's why I'm up for reelection again. Um, you know, as an attorney, I got to work with thousands of families in probate courts all across the state of Ohio. I learned what they go through. I learned the difficulties that they have and now as a judge on the other side of the bench, I get to apply that in understanding what the people before me are going through. So I've, I've got a lot of compassion that I bring to the job. For those of you who don't understand what probate is, it's not the drama court that you see on TV. We're probably considered among attorneys as the boring court. Um, we, we do settlement of decedents estates, guardianships of incompetent adults, um, adult protective services, mental illness, and those types of things. So in reality though, more people in this room will be affected by probate court than any other division of court in our justice system. So it is an important race. And my contention is that experience matters. And I've, I've got far more experience than my, my opponent does. Um, he is a criminal defense attorney and has never done probate before. So I think it's critical that, that we actually keep experience on the bench. Before I end, I am a, I, I was telling somebody this evening before I, I'm doing some research and I found out that my family is a ninth generation resident of Greene County. Um, my great, great, great grandfather was actually a, a former judge in Greene County. And we, we, our family still all lives here. And my beautiful wife, Deanna and I have been married for 41 years and have three children and four grandchildren and one on the way. So thank you for having us tonight. Thank you, Judge. So our first question will be directed at candidates running for the State House, and it is the following. When candidates generally run for office, they run on a platform addressing several issues. What will be your first priority upon entering office? Ms. McCarthy, would you like to start? hard to pick just one, I must admit, but I would say that um, addressing the broken school funding formula is going to be my number one priority. Um, it's been decades since the Supreme Court of Ohio ruled that it was unconstitutional 
to rely on property taxes to fund our schools. And if many of you are here, um, live in Bellbrook Sugar Creek, you're aware of the battle we've been going through for the last year or so. You know, our schools have had failed levies after failed levies because the burden on our property taxes has grown too much. So the state has actually defunded education over the last 20 years. And for me, our values should be represented in our budget. So education is obviously the cornerstone of any civilized society. And if we want to keep Ohio strong, we need to invest in education. And the state is failing in that regard. So that will be my priority. My top priority would be healthcare, um, but it's more of a dual headed thing because while I'm there, I, I will try to slow down some of the um, dead bills that's being passed by the current house, such as um, gun legislation and stopping some of the um, reproductive laws they're trying to push through Ohio House. And also, I think, um, I'm not sure Ms. Perales could probably tell me, more, to expand on it more, but I think they also was talking about um, next year budget and budget cuts. So even though my main focus would be healthcare, my, my other focus would be fighting for the people on those major issues, gun control, um, school, um, women reproductive health, and slowing down some of the legislation that the supermajority has been pushing through Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. We will next move to our candidates running for county commissioner and to, and to them, we have the same question. What will be your first priority upon entering office? It will be to uh, uh, relook at the budget because of COVID-19. You don't have the tax revenues coming in like they used to be. And so there's no doubt in my mind that that budget is gonna have to be relooked and uh, look at the priorities and understand what can continue to be funded, partially funded or not funded. Um, I believe you don't, you don't cut the budget on the backs of people. Um, and you, and you try, you try to evenly disperse, uh, or disperse the, uh, um, uh, where budgets get cut. So that's, that, that would be the first thing. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my opponent's right. The, the budget is very important. Our county commissioners right now have done a, a very nice job and, and they're, they're in a good position with the care money coming down. Uh, but we don't know how long this is going to go. I would say the biggest thing that I can offer to, to the uh, county commissioners is my uh, background with the base, uh, BRAC. You know, whether you like it or not, uh, the base is the economic engine of this area, uh, far and away. And, and we're poised to do even better. I've got three bills recently passed through the General Assembly that makes this a better spot to land for missions and more people to come. And when more people come and they get the, 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 the amount of money they get at the base, it, it's wealth for all of us and it helps the schools and every, the roads and the infrastructure. So, you know, we've got to keep working this relationship with the base and we've got to poise ourselves to be able to capture missions like the F-35 sustainment mission or the um, space command mission that's going to be decided early next year we've got to do it put our best foot forward to do that and i've been there and i know how to do that so i believe that i can make a difference here thank you so our next question is directed at uh mr lockman can you just please talk a little bit about what the ohio court of appeals deals with and what kind of cases usually come before the court As Chris mentioned earlier, uh, the Second District Court of Appeals is one of 12 Court of Appeal districts in Ohio. We all know about the trial courts. Those are where you see jury trials, you get a speeding ticket, you go in front of the trial court. We know at the top of the chain in Ohio is the Ohio Supreme Court. That's the court of last resort. In between is the Court of Appeals. Um, as Chris mentioned, the Second District covers Champaign, Clark, Dark, Green, Miami, Montgomery County. So every case that comes out of the trial courts of those six counties can be appealed almost every case as of right 
to the second district. For 90 some odd percent of the cases, because the Ohio Supreme Court only takes about 7% of the cases that are requested it take. It is the court of final resort for most cases that come out of trial courts in these six counties. So the people that sit on that court is very important because generally that is going to be, whether it's a criminal case, whether it's a domestic relations case, whether it's a civil case, a lawsuit between two companies, two parties, it is going to be the court of last resort where you want judges who have the experience and the knowledge to hear those cases. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be directed at Judge Adayam. Many times when Muslims pass, they wish to have their assets distributed uh, sort of in accordance with their religious belief. Um, in your view, do religious people have the right to have their assets distributed uh, in accordance with their religious belief? I do believe that they have the right to have their assets distributed according to their religious belief, but it also has to be distributed according to the manner that, that Ohio law provides. Um, regardless of your religious belief, there's a structure in the Ohio Revised Code for creating many various types of estate planning documents, whether it be a trust, what you will, um, you know, non-probate transfer on death <clears throat> and things like that. So, um, I know as an estate planning attorney, I, I represented many clients who were Muslim, Hindu, um, Jewish, you know, all kinds of faiths. And everybody had different beliefs and different things that they wanted reflected in their estate plan. So there's no conflict between having a good estate plan that, that is enforceable in Ohio law and having your religious beliefs on it. I can tell you in my court, in the seven years that I've been there, we've never had a religious dispute over anything. I, I Every file that I've ever looked at, I have no idea what anybody's religion is um, because that's not an issue um, if as long as their as long as their estate plan is, is properly in place then the court will by all means honor it because that's what Ohio law provides thank you thank you judge so we will now go back to our candidates running for the Ohio State House since the release of the George Floyd video we have seen a wave of protests spread across our communities. What, what does the Ohio legislature need to do to ensure that all Ohioans, regardless of their identity, get treated fairly by law enforcement? All right, well, that's obviously a huge, far-reaching question. It's going to take a multifaceted approach to address the systematic racism that exists in this country. Um, declaring racism a public health crisis, I think, is the first step um, that we can take so that it can then, basically, data can be uh, you know, obtained and we can look at the problem to see how it affects things like education, uh, healthcare, poverty, all of these uh, different issues. Um, as far as police racism goes, um, or issues in the police force, I think firstly, there is a bill in that the House passed that is still sitting in the Senate that allows for first responders like police to be um, eligible for PTSD uh, treatment through workers' compensation um, without a physical injury. So basically, we need to take care of those first responders and ensure that they have the help they need so that they can uh, do their jobs properly. And if there are tasks that we can delegate to other types of entities like traffic control, like um, car accident insurance adjusters, that kind of thing, we need to take the load off our police forces as much as possible because the budget has been cut on them through the local government fund for over a decade now. So, that's, thank you. When it comes to George Floyd, um, how can any anyone teach someone to have humanity for another person? Or not? 
you can. That's that's something either you have it or you don't. Uh, for eight minutes, this George Floyd was saying, I can't breathe. Um, most humans, if you see somebody saying, I can't breathe, you will call 911, get an um, ambulance there to help them out. You can't teach that. There's no law that can teach humanity. Um, but what we can do, we can hold bad officers accountable. Um, we can make it so that each county and each city across Ohio have body cameras and we can make laws that any time a police officer interacts with a civilian that that body camera is rolling. We can invest in training police officers so they know not to be afraid of other people who are not from their social background or ethical back, um, ethnic backgrounds. So they know how to talk to one another. So they can see us as humans. Um, what we can do, we can um, have commission boards and take, and, and when I say commission boards, I mean doing an officer involved shooting, have a, a board look into that, take it out of the attorney general's hand or the DA hands and have them take a look at it and see if it needs to go to a grand jury. It's stuff we can do that to hold police accountable for misactions, but when it comes to teaching humanity, there's something you either you have it or you don't. Thanks. Thank you. We are going to ask our candidates running for the Green County Board of Commissioners that same question. What does the Green County Board of Commissioners need to do to ensure that all Ohioans, regardless of their identity, are treated fairly and humanely by law enforcement? So I, what I'd say is that 99% uh, of law enforcement are good people. Uh, you, you know, there's a few bad apples, same thing in the army uh, with, with teachers. So I think it's a, it's a matter of training. Uh, uh, if you need body cameras, then, then, then that should be implemented. Um, but I, think, I really think it comes down to training and just being open-minded. And uh, like I said, I think most people, most police officers that I know of, um, and I've lived in a lot of places, um, are good people, um, very sensible, um, and uh, are very humane. Like I said, there's a, there's a few bad apples out there, and at that point, um, you know, they're gonna they're gonna do what they you know what they're gonna do. I think it's also incumbent on the uh, law enforcement community, but also police itself. As a uh, uh, Army Reservist, as a Colonel, um, I have a standard of uh, 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 equal opportunity, uh, prevention of sexual harassment, um, and it's on me to hold that standard and hold all my soldiers accountable for their actions in that regard. So I think there's, there, there has to be some uh, internal uh, uh, policing, not, not to use that pun, but um, that has to be done inside law enforcement as well. Thank you. So uh, I will tell you, I don't think you're going to hear a whole lot different from me. I think uh, what my opponent said that 99%, 98% of our law enforcement first responders are good, decent people, and we have to support them. I think this defunding our police is crazy. I don't think people understand where that's going to lead this. Uh, I think what we need to do is put more money into it, maybe more expertise in it. You know, the House of Representatives, we passed a, a bill for body cam. So uh, I think that's a good start so we can not only to help the, the um, perpetrator, but also to help the officer if he's or she is doing the right thing. Uh, I also think that we need to keep doing what we're doing about um, getting our young people involved and knowledgeable and understanding our police officers. And I think the D.A.R.E. program is a great example. Uh, and I know a lot of people, that's not popular right now, but I will say that, you know, somebody at the uh, high school that is an officer that can talk to the kids and, 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 and be on an even kill with the kids and be there if they have a problem, lots of things going on in our high schools, uh, be there to help those children. I think in the long run, they will be better citizens and they will understand that our police officers are assets, they're friends, they're not enemies. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is directed to Mr. Lockman. Many times, Carroll, Ohio deals with issues in schools where 
students uh, have accommodation issues where they are trying to exercise their right to pray uh, in school. And so these prayers at most can take up five minutes. So what legal rights in your view should be accorded to Muslim students in middle school and high school that wish to pray? You know, as I said earlier, um, one of the important things in who we reflect as judges is knowing that it's someone who is going to respect the laws and the principles that this country was founded on, the idea of equal protection under the law, and that that applies, the First Amendment rights apply to everybody. And it is not unreasonable for a um, school district to provide those necessary accommodations. It is not to do it. Obviously, there's always a weighing, but what you describe, that is an accommodation that I believe is easily implemented. Um, so what can the courts do? The courts can make sure that if a matter is brought, that accommodations are not being made, that they are not taking the steps necessary, that First Amendment is protected, and that is where courts can step in. They're not being activists. They're not le legislating from the bench. They're telling municipalities are telling school districts that you have to follow the First Amendment. You have to respect the religious values of everybody in those schools and to provide accommodations like you described here is not an onerous one that shouldn't be followed. Thank you. Our next question is directed to Judge Adayam. For a deceased person who has immediate family members abroad, the probate process can be very challenging for the deceased person's family. What can be done to make it easier for immigrants in a probate court when dealing with the situation? That's an interesting question because we just had a case like that for the last six months um, where all the beneficiaries were overseas and the, the process under Ohio law is exactly the same um, the, the difficulty that we encounter is the requirements of notice. You have to have notice, you have to have hearings. And it's difficult to get notice to people who live in nine different countries. Um, it's difficult to have hearings and, and to provide them with means of participating. Interestingly, we did have uh, one situation during that case where we did have people on Zoom from other countries. So that technology that we've adopted as a result of COVID, um, but the technology that we have adopted in our court is broadening our ability to do that. The difficulty is still notice. And I don't mean to throw this on the state legislatures, but the most important thing you have to understand is a judge's role is to uphold the law that is written by the legislature. So changes do need to be made and they need to be made in the legislature. As a judge, I don't have the ability to say, well, I don't like that law, so I'm not going to enforce it. We do a lot of times advocate. We have organizations within judge groups that um, we have probate law association. We have probate law and procedure committee of the Ohio Judicial Conference. And we do advocate. Rick and I and, and two other legislators have a meeting next week on advocating for a change of law and name changes that me and my deputy clerk actually created to make it easier to get driver's license. Um, because we go through the name change process. But my point is, I would love to improve the law. Judges can't do it alone. We have to do it working with the legislature. Thank you. We will now go back to our candidates running for state house. The issue of gun safety is a hotly contested issue in the state house and one that many Ohioans uh, think a lot about, regardless of which side of the issue they fall on. Uh, in your view, do you think that restrictions like mandatory background checks and red flag laws are a good idea for Ohio? I absolutely do believe that um, certain changes have to be made. We obviously are experiencing a gun violence problem in this state and country, and doing nothing is no longer an option. 
um, red flag laws. I think if there is due process included in those laws to ensure that there is not room for abuse, I would definitely support. And mandatory is it background checks. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, mandatory background checks. I mean, that's a, that's a given. Um, you know, I think we have to be able to research um, gun violence, just like racism, when there's no studying being done, like it hasn't happened for the last 20 years. Um, it just, I guess there was federal money allocated at the beginning of this year to actually study gun violence, to understand why it's happening, where it's coming from, so that we can come up with solutions to address it. Thank you. Earlier, one of, one of the, I think the first question, the second question was asked, what was one of my priorities? And I said, um, slowing down gun laws. Um, one of the gun laws I was trying to slow down is having teachers carry guns in school. I don't know of any teachers unions clamoring that they want to carry guns. I, do, I would try to stop the stand your ground law. Um, most police officers do not like that law and most, um, district attorneys do not like that law because it takes away who, who has the right to stand stand their ground, who, who was in the wrong, who was in the right. It, they do not like that. Um, what's one more law they were was, they was saying? Um, not having, not, not needing a license to have a concealed weapon. Why try to pass that law? Those three bills right there, I would try to try to stop. I believe in background checks. I believe in red flags laws. I also believe that if you own a gun, you should have gun gun owners insurance. It, it exists, it's out there. Um, make gun owners accountable for their weapons. Um, that's it. All right, so the call to prayer should be happening in the next minute or so, right? So we are going to take a 15 minute break. A uh, couple more housekeeping things. Uh, please do hand your questions to Sister Amina, who is raising her hands there in the back. And please be sure to sign up on Sister Busma's phone, which I guess is going around the room. Right, Busma? Okay, all right. So I'll take that as a yes. So again, that is for advocacy purposes. So again, we will take a 15-minute break. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. It is. It is live on Zoom. Thank you. We're running. Um, and the question is, can you explain to us what is your judicial philosophy? How do you decide cases? My judicial philosophy is pretty easy because I took an oath to um, uphold the Constitution of the United States and the state of Ohio and the laws of the state of Ohio and that's exactly what I do. Um, I, I am I am a one who is very very um, deeply believes in the law and I follow the law exactly. I, I have a very good understanding that it's not my role as a judge to say well I don't like it working out that way and I don't like it working out this way. I have had very very difficult cases that come before me where I have had to make decisions based on the law that I personally did not agree with and it's very hard to do. Um, I have had to make decisions in adoption cases uh, that it's going to affect a child's life forever that it was very very difficult to do but you know, I guess the best way to explain my judicial philosophy in a nutshell is when the day I was sworn in on when I was first appointed, the, um, the keynote speaker at my swearing in is a federal district judge in Dayton. And he said, he said six words to me that have ingrained in me for my entire judicial career so far. And those six words were <clears throat> always be true to the law. So that's what I do. I would echo what, first of all, what the judge has said. I think it is important that any judge, first and foremost, they follow the law. It's not a judge's um, job to 
to write law, but rather to apply the law and make sure that in the case of an appellate court judge, that the trial court judge has applied the law correctly. But adding one thing to that, especially for an appellate court judge, and I see it too often in one commitment that I have, one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about the law and the reason I'm doing this, too often judges decide what they think the outcome of a case should be. And then they, as any lawyer can do, they go and they find precedent to support that finding. It is so important, in my opinion, for a judge to go in with an open mind, to not have any preconceived notions of what the result should be, to consider the arguments that are made before both sides, read the law that exists, and make a decision based on the facts presented and the law presented without any preconceived notions. And as a judge, that's what I would recommend. So this question is for our uh, commissioners who are running. Um, budgets, budget cuts are going to be inevitable um, because of the pandemic. And um, you both have alluded to that. Uh, what do you as a candidate for Green County Board of Commissioners, what will you prioritize to keep funded? And what are you more willing to cut funding from? So uh, my priority in terms of uh, maintaining funding is services to the uh, citizens, right? That's, uh, that's, the, that's the purpose of, of having uh, county government um, to support the people, support the other municipalities. Uh, what I would look at in terms of cuts is uh, uh, anything that can be rolled to the right um, in terms of time, uh, maybe infrastructure investment, um, maybe some economic development, but uh, the services to, uh, to the people have to continue. Uh, and so that, that, that will be my priority. And like I said before, I don't believe uh, balancing the budget on the backs of the, uh, the employees. Um, and I think, you know, um, there's surplus there. It's not gonna be there because of COVID-19, but we're, uh, uh, I don't think we're as bad off is, is other counties are. Thank you. So uh, clearly, uh, as my opponent said, services to the folks is the most important thing. I will tell you this, that your current Green County Commissioners has done a, a, a fine job. Uh, as soon as this hits, the virus hit, they stopped all new construction and they stopped all promotions and hiring. Uh, that was a good move. They still are in that mode now, and we will maintain that mode when I'm there because we don't know how long this virus is going to hit. I think that we also have money coming from the state, uh, from the feds through the state. Uh, Green County got $6 million. The bill was just signed by the governor yesterday. I approved that bill. Um, the, every jurisdiction, including Bellbrook and Sugar Creek, got money out of that. And we're trying to figure out how we can loosen the ties on how you can use that money uh, uh, outside of just PPE. And, and, uh, uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to use a lot of it for our first responders. So being innovative, working with the state on how we can use the Fed money, and there's probably more coming uh, so that we can make our communities whole is gonna be important and sticking to what we're doing right now. And I think we'll be fine. We just gotta be frugal. Thank you. So our last question is to um, our our guests who are running for um, state representatives. Um, we know that our state house has a super majority and which oftentimes can lead to corruption. Um, what will you do to address gerrymandering if you win? For um, redrawing of the districts because um, the 2020 census is happening now and the lines will be redrawn next year. So it's not just drawing of the state lines, it's the congressional lines as well. So, you know, when we look at back to 2018, there were the number of votes for Republicans and Democrats were about even, but it's still because of gerrymandering ended up with a majority, super majority of Republicans in the House. So basically we need to get more Democrats in this time to ensure that the laws that were put in place to change it are actually followed. 
So if I am elected, I will basically be that person to hold um, the Republicans accountable to ensure that the lines are not drawn so that the representative is picking his voters, not the other way around. Thank you. I believe when it comes to drawing um, district lines that it should be the people, a nonpartisan group, come together and draw, it, draw out the lines, have public input, make sure that not one party has a supermajority throughout the state. It, it should be straight looking at the numbers, straight drawing the districts, and there's many groups out there who dedicate their lives just, just looking at the numbers, drawing districts. I think we should tap into that, that group, make sure it's nonpartisan, and make sure that the public have some say in these districts and not be um, forced to have one county Democratic and 13 counties Republican. Thank you all for answering those questions. And so we're going to move to closing remarks to close off the evening. Um, and so you have an audience, a Muslim audience. Many of you have been here for the, into a masjid, likely, or a mosque for the first time. And so if you have two minutes each, um, you'll be timed uh, by Lina. And if we could start uh, maybe with the judges. All right. Thank you so much for this opportunity because of COVID, um, these opportunities are few and far between this time around. And it is a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you in person. You know, the events of the last few weeks um, with the death of Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been, has really put a spotlight on the judiciary and the importance of who our judges are. It's, part of discuss it's created a discussion on both sides. Wherever side of the issue you're on, of the political spectrum you're on, you know now, the importance of judges. And unfortunately, too often in Ohio, people go to the polls and they don't know who their judges are. And that's, it show, that, that, that's a shame because who our judges are matters. They affect our lives. I am running for the Second District Court of Appeals because I believe so strongly in our system of justice, that I believe in our democracy. And for it to succeed, you need judges who have the experience, who have the knowledge, who have the trust to make the decisions that are necessary, that are not making decisions based on a political agenda, but based on the law. That no party has more power in front of them than another party. Those are the things that matter. I have lived in the Miami Valley for more than 20 years. I've raised my three children in this community. My youngest daughter, my wife Amy and I will watch our youngest daughter graduate from Centerville High School in the spring. It is so important to me that we have judges who have the experience, who have done this for 32 years. I understand the intricacies of the law. I have the respect. I have been honored by the judges of Montgomery County for the work I have done in that court. I have been honored by the judges of the Montgomery County Juvenile Court for the work I have done in that court. And I ask for your support on November 3rd. For more information about my campaign, you can go to marshallforjudge.com. You can also go to my Facebook page at Marshall for Judge. There's some literature in the back. Please take it. Please get informed about who your judge candidates are. Understand them and make informed decisions and talk to your friends and family about it. Again, thank you. I also have enjoyed being here this evening. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a unique experience for me never been in a mosque um, so that I can I can check this off my bucket list is something I've done um, I, I agree with mr. Lackman that that to me and if you if you go on my um, campaign materials you will find that there is nothing in the world more more important in the judiciary than experience um, and I and I think that's where there is such a stark contrast between me and my opponent as I said earlier I have 35 years of experience focusing on probate law. My opponent is a criminal defense attorney who's never done a probate case in his life. 
Now, I think all you have to do as a voter is put you in a position that do you want that, do you want your case in probate court when you're grieving the loss of a loved one or you're, <clears throat> you're struggling with an elderly parent that you have to take care of or you have a, an elderly friend or family member who's going through abuse, neglect, or exploitation? Do you want that judge to know what he's doing or do you want that to be his first day to ever do probate? I think that's simply what it comes down to. Um, I, I, I have the same passion for the laws Mr. Lackman does. It's a different area of the law. Um, I, I, I've never done criminal law. My opponent may be a good criminal defense attorney. I am passionate about all the law, but I am not only passionate, I am very, very, very experienced in probate law. I'm exactly where I want to be. This is what I've done my whole career. Um, this is exactly what I want to do. And that's why I think I'm the right person for the job to stay in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If we can move on to our state, our, uh, our guests who are running for state. No problem. All right. Um, yes, I too have enjoyed being here. This is my first in-person candidate um, forum so far because of COVID. It is not my first time here though. I did attend um, the memorial service after the New Zealand shooting that occurred a number of years back. I'm from Australia originally, so New Zealand is obviously one of our, it's like our brother, our little brother. So I really appreciated having the opportunity to express my grief at the situation and you were very welcoming and it was an amazing experience. So thank you for that. So um, basically voters do have a very distinct choice in our race. I'm sorry my opponent isn't here so you won't be able to see that for yourself. But um, I am a candidate who has done the work to be an effective and honest representative in Columbus. I've spent years dedicating myself in my community to organizing with people around the issues that we face and making sure that our elected officials are held accountable to the people that, that um, they are elected to serve. It's basically my passion. People can disagree with me on certain issues and that's okay, but I think one thing we can agree on is that we need real change in Columbus right now. We need representatives who know that good public policy can help people's lives be made better. Unfortunately, right now, the corruption that exists is preventing those issues from being addressed. And really, decency is gone. Um, my opponent actually sent out two mailers in the last two days about me that are complete lies. They photoshopped my face onto a different person's body to make it look like I was a rioter and a person who sprays graffiti on houses and um, I'm promoting violence and anarchy in the streets. And we see that message being spread all across the country, frankly, and it has to end. The divisiveness, the, um, the straight up lies is not helpful to our democracy. So if you got that mailer in your mailbox, um, I ask that you look at things with a critical eye because people will lie. That's what a super majority um, breeds. So I'm running to help restore your trust in government and I ask for your vote this November. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, and thank all the other candidates for showing up. Um, the very first question tonight was, why have I run? And my answer was, and still is the answer. Um, I believe the government role is to protect and uplift its citizens. Uh, there is no politician that know, has all the answers. Um, the answers come from, from everywhere. There is no political party with all the answers. If we want to build a better Ohio, we have to change what we're doing right now. And what we're doing right now has been a supermajority by the GOP. Um, we need some different voices. Need, and even 
if I win, I, I need the citizens to hold my feet to the fire. Because like I said before, no politician has all the answers. We, we depend, this is how democracy works, the people. It's more than just voting. It's, it's letting your congressperson, your representative know how the laws actually affect them. At the state house, the laws are passed all the time and with no regards, it seems like, to what, how it actually affects the common person. The state taxes have been cut, but they've trickled down to local, local cities and counties to make up the shortfalls. There's disparity between school districts. There's disparity between different zip codes throughout the county. We all know that's not right. So that's why I'm running, like I said before, because there's a lack of empathy and there's a lack of listening to the voices of the people. Thank you. Finally, if we'd like to invite our, one of our county commissioners who'd like to maybe start. Thank you. Shakran. Uh, I want to thank the Islamic Society of Greater Data for uh, sponsoring this. It's a pleasure to be here. I didn't mention earlier that my youngest daughter was born in Riyadh, so she has dual citizenship. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, I, I think it is. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a novelty. We, we enjoy that. Uh, I had my family there before the first war. Um, l listen, um, when I uh, came up on my, I told everyone here I was uh, term limited. Eight years. Um, I, you know, eight years is eight years. That's the law. I understand that. I, I don't complain about that. Um, I love that job. Um, and when my wife and I talked a little bit about what's next, uh, you know, do we start making some money for the family and retirement and grandkids, getting them through school? Um, we looked at each other and it was very simple. She said, Rick, you're about service. I've always been about service. I've always been about looking out and taking care of my fellow person, whether it's fighting for my country or whether it's fighting for the city, whether it's fighting for the county, the state. Uh, this is what I do, and this is what I do well. So we could talk about all the specific issues, but, but I think what's really important in this job, and really for all the folks up here, is you have someone committed, committed to doing this and doing it right. I'm 24-7, and everyone, I'm available all the time. I give my card out, it's got my cell number. If a legislator or any elected official doesn't give their cell number out, they're not 24-7. Um, I take calls all the time. That's what I do, and, and I love it. And, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, four years at the county commission. And I think I can bring to bear all the stuff I've learned as a mayor, as a uh, county commissioner the first time, and as a state rep. So I would uh, encourage, I got signs back there. I've got some literature. Uh, my, my website is uh, Paralysis for Ohio. Uh, go to that, learn a little bit more about where I stand on things, and talk to those for young folks over there, get to know them a little bit and, and, and show them uh, how, how hospitable the Islamic community is. I thank you very much, Sakran. Thank you for having us, I appreciate it. Um, Why well, I think I'm a better candidate than, than Rick. Uh, uh, I work in the private sector, so like most of everybody, most of the people in the room, you know, we're out there working every day. Uh, and for me, I work in a profit and loss domain. So I'm, a, I'm held accountable for what I do, you know, in the, uh, for the revenue I bring in. So I have, I have context for what the business community has to operate in. When we as government officials uh, uh, create policy, I understand what it ha the impact it has on the business community. Uh, I'm a, uh, on the Fairborn City Council, I'm the uh, deputy mayor in Fairborn. Um, I do this for, for public service. Uh, uh, just in, in, uh, at my level, you don't make any money on the city council. And I've donated my, uh, my year's uh, council salary to uh, charity. But the reason you should vote for me, I'm much better looking than Rick. Uh, Rick uh, has been a, uh, he's been a uh, career politician. Um, and hasn't been out in the private sector. He needs a break. If you look at him, he looks pretty tired. He, he, uh, so, you know, my thought is, 
as politicians, uh, politicians should have to go out, work in the private sector, understand what that means, and then come back into government and, and provide services for people. I think you get too comfortable if you're sitting there year in, year out, year in, year out, um, and you're really not uh, held accountable. Um, I, 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 I like what I do in the private sector. I like what I do in uh, public service. Um, I've been in the military for uh, 33 years. I've been doing it since I was 18. Uh, so, you know, like Rick says, service is, is, is part of what we do. Um, uh, I think that uh, people will find me uh, much more um, understanding of the business environment and putting people first. Um, if you can't put people first, uh, it's problematic. And I will say, uh, Rick, you voted on some things that uh, I, I don't think are, are uh, uh, appropriate uh, symbols uh, towards uh, minorities. Uh, you know, uh, Rick has voted to protect those things. Uh, me, it's all about the people. You gotta protect the people. Um, that's why we're elected. Thank you. So that's it for the forum. So on behalf of ISGD and CARE Ohio, thank you so much for all the candidates for coming to attend. Thank you already for your service to our community because most of you are, are lifelong service members um, in your current position. Um, and I think that will do it. It's a, it's a wrap. I don't know if some of you guys will be maybe spending a little bit of more time, maybe uh, if you know, so you have some questions to be able to hang around, it's completely up to you. I know there was a youth member that wanted to potentially give anyone a tour that was interested. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you for all your hard work. And, uh, and good luck. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate that. Yep, of course. So what, is, what else are we doing? Is there going to be a tour? So it, it's completely up to you. Um, we have a couple of youth members. I believe my understanding was in the beginning, the idea was to be able to potentially do that. If okay. that's something that you're interested in. If I'm the only one, it's, I yeah. can, it's, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, we could definitely ask.